The next speaker, Alexander Marcos, is the editor of the excellent Duran magazine, and I welcome him to the microphone. Alexander. Thank you, George. Um, what I will say today, I'd like to build a bit on what George was saying about this being essentially a political issue. Because, of course, what we're looking at at the moment is what is supposed to be a legal process. And it's that legal process I'm going to discuss because I'm going to argue that this legal process is clearly, radically, uh, essentially wrong. Now, since these charges that have been brought against Julian Assange originate from the United States. I'm going to do something unusual, and I think it'll be a bit dry, but I think it'll be informative. I'm going to quote to you what American lawyers are saying about this. This is because in any case which involves uh, the United States, with a charge brought in the United States, it is American law that matters. Now, the key law the law that is the fundamental law that governs the way journalism is supposed to be conducted in the United States and which sets out the issue of freedom of the press is the First Amendment up to the Constitution. And it reads as follows. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, the key words, obviously, are Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech and of the press. Now, the case everybody in the United States always refers to it, in any, connect, in any case involving the First Amendment is the Pentagon Papers case. The Pentagon Papers was a case which happened in 1971 when a whistleblower leaked, from within the Pentagon, leaked a huge amount of papers that showed that US policy during the Vietnam War had been entirely intentional and calculated that the story that the United States blundered into that war with good intentions was wrong and he was able to prove it on the basis of the documentation that the Pentagon itself had produced and which he published through the New York Times. Now, the United States government attempted to prosecute the New York Times to prevent publication of the Pentagon Papers and the, it went all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States, and the Supreme Court of the United States said, no, we, you cannot stop publication of the Pentagon Papers because doing so is contrary to the First Amendment of the Constitution. Now, I'm going to just mention at this point what a particular American lawyer says about this in relation to the case which is now being brought against Julian Assange. This is an American law lawyer, Alan Dershowitz, who I disagree with almost entirely on every political issue. But I do accept that he is an outstanding lawyer. I don't think that has any, any issue about this. Now, what he says is this. If the prosecutors were to charge Assange with espionage or any other crime for merely publishing the Manning material, this would be another Pentagon Papers case, i.e. a First Amendment case, with the same likely outcome. Many people have misunderstood the actual Supreme Court ruling in 1971. It did not say that the newspapers planning to publish the Pentagon Papers could not be prosecuted if they published classified material. It only said that they could not be restrained or stopped in advance from publishing them. Well, they did publish and they were not prosecuted. Now, that is the view 
not just of Alan Dershowitz, it was also the view of Barack Obama's Department of Justice. They looked into this very carefully and they said, if we start prosecuting Julian Assange for publishing, publishing classified material as a journalist, um, that will fall, that will fail because of the First Amendment defense that was used in the Pentagon Papers case. And if it were to succeed, which we don't think, then it might have an effect on freedom of speech and of the press generally. That was the view that Barack Obama's Department of Justice took. It is also the view, incidentally, of Rudy Giuliani, who is Donald Trump's personal lawyer, former mayor of New York, former federal prosecutor, and also someone who has represented Trump during the Mueller investigation. He has publicly, gone out publicly, and said the same thing. So, we're looking at a potential problem for the United States under the First Amendment if they go after Julian. Now, um, it's been mentioned here, there's been a discussion here about whether, in fact, uh, Julian Assange has the right to this protection. People have said, well, you know, he's not actually really a journalist, or he's not a real journalist. I want to state on record that I personally think that Julian Assange is a great journalist. But let's see what Alan Dershowitz has to say about that argument. This is a legal argument that he's making now. He says, prosecutors might try to distinguish the cases on the grounds that the New York Times is a more responsible outlet than WikiLeaks. But the First Amendment does not recognize degrees of responsibility. When the Constitution was written, our nation was plagued with irresponsible scandal sheets and broadsheets. No one described political pamphleteers, Tom Paine or James Callender, as responsible journalists of their day. Not only is that argument phony and a smear of Julian Assange, it has no basis in law. It should not be made. Anyone who makes it is speaking in bad faith. Now, the United States, the US government, the Department of Justice, Donald Trump's Department of Justice knows that they have a major problem bringing a case under the First Amendment. So they haven't done that. They've tried instead this extremely strange case um, in which they are basically accusing Julian Assange of uh, engaging in a computer fraud with Chelsea Manning, Bradley Manning, as she was then, to try to, to get information, to, to extract information from the computer. Now, what does Dershowitz say about this case? The courts have ruled the journalists may not break the law in an effort to obtain material whose disclosure would be protected by the First Amendment. But the problem with the current effort he means the case against Julian Assange, is that while it might be legally strong, it seems on the face of the indictment to be factually weak. It alleges that, quote, Assange encouraged Manning to provide information and records, unquote, from federal government agencies, that, quote, Manning provided Assange with part of a password, unquote, and that, quote, Assange requested more information, unquote. It goes on to say that Assange was, quote, trying to crack the password, but had no luck so far. So what does Dershowitz say? Not the strongest set of facts here. I would say that was an understatement. And in fact, Dershowitz goes on to say, the first question is whether a legal theory based on such inchoate facts 
will be sufficient for an extradition request. Now, I'm going to say something here which um, um, I, I, I'd like to touch on, which is that obviously this, the facts for this conspiracy are extremely weak on the face of the indictment. What is very concerning is that the United States government appears to be trying to get those facts, make, make them look stronger by trying to get Julian Assange's alleged co-conspirator, Chelsea Manning, to testify against him. And the effect is that Chelsea Manning is now being held in what appears to be indefinite detention because she is refusing to provide evidence before a grand jury. I have to say that Chelsea Manning's courage and integrity fills me with awe. I So, do we really want to extradite Julian Assange to a country where people are held in indefinite detention in order to get them to testify against each other? Obviously not. Now, what did Julian Assange actually do? Why did he do it? Well, um, I'm now going to turn to another American law lawyer, one who I tend to agree with rather more, who is Glenn Greenwald. Now, Greenwald is important because he is not just a lawyer and a very fine lawyer, he is also a journalist. So he understands journalism very well and he has a very strong interest in these sort of cases because they affect his own practice and work as a journalist. So, what does Greenwald say? He says the following. The key fact being widely misreported is that the indictment accuses Assange of trying to help Manning obtain access to document databases to which he had no valid access, i.e. hacking rather than journalism. But the indictment alleges no such thing. Rather, it simply accuses Assange of trying to help Manning log into the, department, into the Defense Department's computers using a different username so that she could maintain her anonymity while downloading documents in the public interest and then furnish them to WikiLeaks to publish. In other words, the indictment seeks to criminalize what journalists are not only permitted but ethically required to do, take steps to help their sources maintain their anonymity. We've heard earlier today from Annie Macken how important it is for journalists to protect their sources if whistleblowers are actually to be able to do their job properly. This is a very dangerous indictment. It goes to the root of what journalists do. It is intended to make the whole process of journalistic investigation all but impossible, especially when it concerns secrets, the most important secrets that governments in the United States and elsewhere want to keep hidden. Now, it gets even worse about this case because something which I've never seen anybody mention except one person and that is that this case against Julian Assange is actually brought out of time. Now what I mean by that is that there is a statute of limitation in the United States which says that cases of this court, sort should be brought within five years. Now what happened, what, whatever it was that Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning were doing, with, were doing together, they did in 2010. We're now in 2019. The indictment against them dates from, I believe, uh, 2017. It's, fact, it's, almost eight, it's almost eight years later. So um, I'm now going to turn to another American lawyer. This is Andrew McCarthy, a federal prosecutor 
a man who is deeply, deeply hostile to Julian Assange, a man of very conservative views, someone I again don't, dis don't uh, agree with on most issues, but who is nonetheless an outstanding lawyer. What does he say about the limitation issue? He says, how is the Justice Department able to prosecute Assange on an indictment filed three years after the prescribed limitation period? It appears that the Justice Department is relying on an exception in Section 2332B of the Penal Code that extends the statute of limitations to eight years for, quote, acts of terrorism transcending national boundaries, unquote. Now, Andrew McCarthy then goes on to say this. I repeat, this is someone who is very hostile to Julian Assange. Now, conspiracy to com co commit computer fraud is a very serious offence, and Assange is at the top of the serious, no or serious range. And there's no doubt that the conspiracy transcended national boundaries. Assange was outside the United States when he collaborated with Manning. But is it really an act of terrorism? Now, Andrew McCarthy goes into a long, erudite discussion about this issue. And if you want to read his article, it's on National Review, he thinks the US government may have an arguable case because the word terrorism is so broadly defined in US law. I've looked at these arguments, I'm going to say straightforwardly, I don't agree. Besides, what does Andrew McCarthy say? It will be a hotly contested issue. Well, yes. And he goes on to say, if the Justice Department is going to succeed in prosecuting Assange, it is going to have to win the statute of limitation argument twice in Britain and in Virginia. That's not going to be a layup, to say the least. Well, certainly not. So we have, what to all appearances, an extraordinary flimsy case here. We have no real case, it would seem, on the First Amendment, on the Espionage Act, so um, that's why it's not being brought. And we have this cobbled together case that's actually being brought um, based upon um, an allegation of conspiracy in which the co-conspirator is not being prosecuted and in which, as a result, she finds herself um, in indefinite detention. How does our government, how do our courts extradite on the basis of all this nonsense? Well, I have to say, um, I would have said in any proper system of law, they wouldn't extradite. But let's look at what the story of Julian Assange has been. Firstly, he was, as we know, sentenced today to 50 weeks in prison. This is in connection with skipping bail in a case, and it was absolutely correct to say it's a case which originates with allegations, allegations of sexual misconduct in Sweden. Um, Julian Assange gave, uh, gave, uh, gave answers to the Swedish investigators in Sweden. He then gave answers again to the Swedish investigators in the Ecuador embassy when they interviewed him there. There is a statement which he published which deals with those allegations in great detail, which has been published, I believe, on the internet, and it may still be there for all I know. Um, the Swedes got all this information from Julian Assange. They never brought charges against him. They are now coming under extraordinary political pressure to bring charges against him, which, by the way, I find extremely disturbing, but we'll put, we'll put that to one side. Let me repeat, he has been sentenced for 50 weeks in prison for skipping bail in a case which was never brought, which doesn't exist. Now, given that that is so, how can any of us 
any of us feel confident about the legal processes in this case. We have an extraordinary case in the United States, which, as we've seen, prominent American lawyers are extremely skeptical about. We've seen an extraordinary uh, uh, case against him here in Britain. We heard the judge today pay no attention at all to any of the points that uh, Julian Assange's counsel put to her and giving the maximum sentence. I think somebody, one of our earlier speakers said, this doesn't feel right. It isn't right. That's why it doesn't feel right. This case is not going to be won in the courts. It's going to be won in places like this by people like us, people coming here, protesting, speaking out, pointing out how wrong this is, how abysmally this man is being treated in, uh, uh, by, by our courts, by our legal system, by the authorities. And we must renew the political struggle to defend him. This frightful machine that has been unleashed upon him for publishing things which have always been true and which it is in our interests to know is a frightful machine which is ultimately going to attack all of us.